camp that you went, before we get started, I got this in the email from somebody in this church. I don't know if they're trying to tell me something. It says, the task ahead of us is never as great as the power behind us. And he says, remember this. He who angers you controls you. And then he puts down, he says, or she said, if a church wants a better pastor, it only needs to pray for the one they have. And I was thinking about it, I said, you know, that makes sense. But you see, people are funny. They want to, they want, people are funny. They want the front of the bus, they want to ride down the middle of the road, but yet, they sit in the back of the church. <laughs> so what are we trying to get at? What camp are you riding in? Are you in the back of the church bus type? Or are you in the front? Well, it depends, right? If I divided you up into camps and said, those that are sitting in the front pews has just got a thousand dollar check. Now, how many people would sit in the front pews? A lot. But see, we sit where we think we're what? Comfortable? Or where we can't be pointed out? You know, a lot of people sit in the back because you don't rarely call somebody all the way in the back. And the pastor normally doesn't bring up comments on people that are all the way in the back. But now I wonder, what about those that sit in the balcony? Yeah. <laughs> I wonder where they fit into the spiritual camp that we're talking about. So what camp are we talking about? Well, there's many camps out there. There's one camp that says, do good and say nothing. The other camp is, do good and say something. In other words, actively engage. Other is a what? An active camp. Another one is a passive camp. But before we get started, what a little bit of the English here. I know you guys didn't come to school to learn English, but evangelize. Is that a verb or a noun? Well, it depends on how we're using it, right? If I say to convert or to seek to convert, to preach the gospel, what would that make the word? That would make it a verb. But now if I say, I'm an evangelist, is that a noun or am I describing the man? If I'm describing him, it makes him a what? Come on, come on, Lewis. What describes a noun? A what? Adjective. Adjective. Come on, time to get back to school a little bit. Why is that so important? Because it's how we use it. We talk about being an evangelist, or we talk about spreading the gospel, or we talk about leading somebody, but sometimes we just want to describe it, but we don't want to do it. We don't want to be the active voice. We just want to be that passive, quiet voice in the background. You know, one comment they said here, what do you say here about? That if you find a perfect church and you like that church, do it a favor and leave because you'll ruin it. <laughs> what is he trying, what, what type of voice is he trying to say here? Saying that what camp are we normally in? Come on. How many times, let me ask you guys a question. Throughout the week, do we compliment something more or do we complain about something more in your life? Not necessarily in the church, but in your life. You know, I hear these farmers, pray for rain. Next thing I know, Stop the rain! <laughs> you know, I hear sermons. It's too long. 
It's too short. I was at a, at a sermon I preached in one place, and I was looking at the time, and I tried to keep my time down because I was a guest and everything. And I sat down, and the pastor looked at me and says, I guess we're not very important, are we? And I says, why? He said, obviously you didn't practice or didn't, you didn't research enough because your sermon was very short. And therefore, you didn't care about us. On the other hand, come and you preach a long sermon, and what do you get? Hello? I got things to do after church. There's important things. You know? You got to beat the Methodists to the, to the, to the restaurant. <laughs> Can't have them getting in front of us. So what camp were you in? Well, in the, in the Greek, the word evangelize, preach, spread the gospel, take the gospel out, tell people, has a couple of things. We in the English language, we have an active, right? And we have a passive voice. Well, in the Greek, you have a middle row voice. It's really not fully active, and it's not fully passive. It's kind of in the middle. It's almost like a reflective voice. You've heard of that before. So the word evangelism, of course, in its form or another, it's mentioned 54 times in the New Testament. Only two times is as an active voice, and you'll find that in Revelations, and four times in a passive voice, you'll find that in, in First and Second Peter. The rest of the time, it's a middle voice. It's kind of like, what are you doing? It's not necessarily an active or a passive, it's right in the middle, where we need to be. We need to be able to tell people about Christ, but we also need to be what? Show the example of Christ. You know, we need to drive the speed limit. I know when I walk on River, Riverside Road there, and, you know, I'm walking down the dog, I said, man, I wish these people would slow down. Well, the other day I was driving, and I saw some people walking on the side of the road. I wish they would get off the road. <laughs> so that I wouldn't have to slow down. But ain't that what we do sometimes as a Christian? We look at it into what? How we want it. In our perspective. You know? And when you start doing that, there's a Bible. Jesus called the Pharisees a name for that. Remember what it was? Hypocrites. So what camp are we selling in? And what camp are we going in? Before we get started, let's go ahead and open up the Lord in prayer. Oh, Heavenly Father, you are an awesome and mighty God. Touch us, Lord, that we may grow and that we may become closer to you. Lord, that we may do what you desire for us to do, for you are an awesome and mighty God. We thank you and we praise you. In the name of Jesus Christ, we pray. Amen. You know, we're going to be doing some things here. We're going to do some uh, evangelism, outreaches. You know, and I noticed the uh, car wash sign has been up for about three weeks now, and we only had one person sign up. And I'm wondering why. Is it that you guys don't like washing cars? Or is it that you just like dirty cars? <laughs> or are you afraid that someone might ask you, why are you washing my car? And you may have to have a what? An answer. You know, and what, we're, what are we saying? We're washing your cars for free with no strings attached. We're not trying to raise money. We're not trying to trick you into something. We're not trying to, to pay for anything. All we're doing is showing you the love of Christ in a practical way. As Jesus washed the sins away from my life, I can't do that for you, but I can wash your car. And you see, as us Christians, we can have a clean. What, what, is, the, what, what is your body? Temple of God. What is it? What, what is it? It's something that carries you through a period of time. When you die, right? We talked about this. When you die, what happens to the body? It goes back to dirt. Dirt, dust to dust, right? The spirit 
Bible says, returns unto God, and your soul is judged. <clears throat> so, what is your body? It's a car that carries you to a period. How many of you have ever bought a new car? Or a different car? <coughs> Right? How many of you have, how many of you, when you bought that car or truck, did you expect it to last forever? When you walked out of that dealer and he handed you the keys, you tell the dealer, the guy that's selling you the car, he says, now you selling me this car, that means this car will never rust, the tires will never wear out, nothing will ever happen to my car, and 20 years from now, when I drive back in here, the car's going to be in the exact same condition as it was when I drove out. Is that the guarantee that you're getting at a car dealer? Well, what happens to our bodies? God creates us. You're, you're created in your mother's womb. He creates you perfect. And then you're born. And then you open your mouth. And then you start doing what? Getting dirty. Getting dirty. So how do we clean ourselves? How do you clean yourselves? You can take a shower and that clean us. Really. No, we need to be washed in the blood. So what camp do we travel in? There's not a single person that has ever received Christ, received it without hearing the word. Every person that has ever accepted Jesus Christ as their Lord and Savior, received it by hearing the word of God. How many of you think by just being nice is going to bring people to Christ? There's a situation right now in North Carolina where the Muslims are growing. And we're going to get to that in a minute. But they're growing. And the pastors don't understand it. They say, well, we're feeding the poor. We're giving food to the poor. We're doing all of these things. But we're not growing our churches. The Muslims are doing the exact same thing, but their congregations are growing. Well, I asked him, have you talked to these Muslims? He says, yeah. And it's pretty disgusting. I said, why? Well, for them to get a free meal, they have to quote a verse out of the Quran. At one point, for them to get free stuff, they've got to mention the seven pillars of Islam. And, I, and, I, and, I, and he said, that, that's so disgusting. I said, what do you think they're doing? They're making them what? Read, Read and hear their gospel. Well, the churches are trying to say, well, we don't want to offend no one. We don't want to make people uncomfortable. And we're losing that battle. Why? It really depends on what camp you're in. So let's talk about the camps here. Passive camp. Many suggest, I think we should just live our Christian life by example. We should have, we shouldn't have to tell people what we believe in. We shouldn't be telling people anything. They should know it by the way we live. What's the old song? We are Christians by our love. Remember that song? Is that a false statement? No, it's not. But see, how do you show your love? If how many of you here love children? Come on. There's nobody in here that ain't gonna love a little child. You see a four or five year old running across an interstate or running across Main Street or 31 or 24, and you see a bunch of cars coming down the road, what are you gonna do? Would you yell? Would you try to stop that child? But then, why? Because you don't want that child hurt. How come then do churches preach that you don't say anything about sin because you might offend someone, you might hurt them? And if a person is sinning, where are they going? Where are they headed? You 
really must hate someone not to tell them about Jesus. You must really dislike that person if you allow them to continue on the route of destruction. In Ezekiel it says, for if you see a brother sinning and you say nothing, that sin is where? On is on you. Yes, but if you see a brother sinning and he doesn't stop sinning, that blood is on who? Yes. On them. Okay. Not on you. Your hands are clean. <laughs> you see, the Bible doesn't tell us we have to make changes. The Bible doesn't tell us that we have to change people. The Bible just tells us that we've got to tell people. And that's evangelism. That is the gospel of Jesus Christ telling the people about what it is. Now, it is not degrading. But a couple months ago, in, down there in Kokomo, we had two homosexual guys that said, ask me, why do you hate me? I said, I don't even know you. He says, but you're a Christian. I said, yeah. Then why do you hate me? I says, I don't. Matter of fact, I love you so much that I'm going to tell you that your lifestyle is going to take you to destruction. If I, didn't, if I didn't care about you, and if I hated you, you know what? I really, then I wouldn't really care where you end up in eternity. Then I asked him, says, why do you hate me? And they looked at me and they says, what do you mean? I said, why do you hate Christians? If we're just trying to help you to get to heaven, why do you hate us so much? And of course, after being cussed out a couple times and said a few nice words, they walked off. But see, the hate is the other way around. We should not tell people because of hate. We should tell people because of what? Love. So, are we in the passive camp? They should know by the way we live. Hear me. Well, here's a guy walking his dog.
You know, and he was all excited about it. And he says, what can you do? And I went back to the back, picked up a case of Bibles, and said, well, brother, you got a prison ministry. Here you start, a case of Bibles. <laughs> but see, that was because of that active voice that activated him. And then he comes back about six months later, and I said, what are you doing? He says, oh, man, you're not going to believe this. Well, I went in front of the judge. And I said, yeah. He says, I confessed everything again. And the judge says, what is wrong with you? He says, I found this man named Jesus. And I was to confess my sins. And the judge sat there and he says, boom, time served. You are free. I mean, that's a, tell me if that's not an active witness. Yes. You know, I'm not afraid to tell them. A police officer pulls me over, so you speed. No! Not me! How many of you guys have ever speed? I, 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 I know how you speed. Okay? I know you're conscious. How many of you, when you see a police officer, do your feet leave the gas pedal, go to the brake, and you look at the gas and at the speed off? That means your guilty conscience is telling you that you speak. <laughs> Otherwise, what? You just keep on going. You know, I got a ticket years ago in North Carolina, and I saw a cop coming, and I honestly didn't think I was speeding. So I just kept going. Next thing I know, I see the blue lights behind me. And he says, didn't you see me? I said, yeah. You didn't even try to slow down. I said, I wasn't speeding. And I, honestly, I really didn't think I was speeding. And he said, well, you were. And gave me a ticket. You know, but the thing was, that sometimes we do that our Christian walk. The Holy Spirit comes to us and convicts us, and we don't think we've done anything wrong. But yet the conviction is in our heart. And instead of continuing the way we're going, let the conviction change. There are quick talk about the numbers of times. Man, I talk to somebody that's actively involved in witnessing. They will tell you over and over how many times they've seen people come to Christ. They see people change their lives. You know, I, I, I listen to testimonies. You know, I don't have this crazy testimony. You know, I've seen, I seen people come to this and say, you know, I was in drugs and I was in all of this and I was doing all of this. And the Holy Spirit came and it cleansed me. And I got out of it, and, and you know, my life train changed. And I'm sitting there going, man, I didn't have that experience. You know, it seems like my life was incremental. It seems like I just slowly walked to Christ a little bit more at a time. But you know, you see these people that I said, man, I have to see that. And then I start thinking about, do I really want that testimony? Do I really want to be down and out in drugs and, and out on the ground? <laughs> Not really. I kind of like my life. I kind of like that I was kind of led to the Lord. And the Lord kind of took me where I was at and put me where I was at before I was in that gutter. Before I was down and out. But you know, the people that are in this active camp, they get excited. How many of you get excited when people come to Christ? Come on. I do. I get excited when we have the heaven's gate and 207 people come and accept Jesus Christ or recommit their lives to Christ. I get, I get fired up. <coughs> because you see, that's what I think we're about. is reaching the lost of Jesus. It's not about bringing people to a building. It's about telling people about Jesus Christ. That's why I get excited when the churches go out and they work together and the purpose of going out is to tell people about Jesus. Tell them that he died for them and that he loves them and that he wants them in his kingdom. That is the most exciting thing that there is. And it is in my life. Some people is making money. You talk to some bankers, they are or these, these people that do all this investment. They, they're excited about when. When they make money. But talk to them when the, when the stocks are down, when they're losing money. You see, at a job, at a farmer, farmer gets excited when he has a good crop. Man, I got a bumper crop this year. Yeah, but corn's, on, corn's at 39 cents a barrel of a bushel. <laughs> Oops. That ain't good. 
So you get high and you go. Bruh. But see, in your Christian walk, you should always be excited. Because you see, you can't go wrong. Telling people about Jesus, you can't go wrong. It's not our job to change people. It's our job to tell them about it. That's it. So you can't go wrong. If they reject you, they're not rejecting you. They're rejecting Christ. But if you don't tell them, and they don't know the difference, even the devil, the Bible says, even the devil knows how to do good. We have to be different. The active camp, they can tell crazy stories. And you get people in the active camp, they get all fired up. They get all excited. So, are they wrong? Are the people in the passive camp or in the active camp? Which one is right or wrong? What do you think? Should you be in the active camp or should you be in the passive camp? Yeah. To be a good Christian, what camp should you be in? You're not afraid to answer a question. Yeah? <laughs> well, fortunately, I have the answer for you. The answer is yes. <laughs> You need to be in the active and passive camp. Yes, you are to be an active witness. Yes, you are to be a passive witness. You are to witness both actively and passively. You, what good is it? You know, I, I, tell, I remember in North Carolina when talking, a friends of ours would come by and say, you know, I can't get my children to quit smoking. And he blows a puff of cigarette in my face. <laughs> I wonder where he got that from. So he was just saying, right? But he wasn't what? Showing. Remember it says, you know, a lot of your actions say more than your words. What you do shows more about who you are. When you come to church and you gossip about your church, what good is that? If you go to your school and you start talking negative about your school and your football team, your, your team players, if you ever, you ever guys ever played in a, in, in a, in a sports, in, in a club, or in a basketball team, or a football team, what happens when you're always negative about your team? It brings down morale. What else, what else happens? If it does, it rubs off on others. And what happens to the outcome of that team? They lose. Okay? They lose. And you see, we're a team here. Just like the Main Street Methodist is a team. The Presbyterians are a team. Family Fellowship is a team. Zion Chapel is a team. We're not competing with them. We're just different parts of this massive team, which is called the church. You know, some of us may be the blockers. Some of us may be the ones that opens up the pathway for another church to make the touchdown. I've said this for many years now. Would you rather see someone on the street unbelieving or someone in a church believing Jesus Christ. In a church. I would like to have them here at First Christian. But you know what? I told a, I told a young couple this week. And I sent them that I sent them back to Family Fellowship. And the pastor called me up and Randy goes, oh yeah, he talked to me about this. Why did you send him back to me? I said, because he's got connection there. That's where he's got his connection. That is where he feels he told him that he was called. And so therefore, my job was to encourage him to do what? Go back to where God is feeding him. Not to try to steal him from another congregation. That's not what we're about. We shouldn't be about that. The workplace needs active members. 40% of adults, 
according to Barna, are unchurched. Now, does that mean 60% are Christians? No. What's the difference between a, somebody that's been churched and an unchurched person versus a believer and a non-believer? Are they all the same? No. How many of you believe that you can go to church all your life and be an unbeliever? You're churched, but you're not a believer. So here it's talking about 40%. We're not talking about believers. Remember, 40% are what? Unchurched. I mean, they don't know nothing. They know zero about our traditions. They don't understand what the bread stands for. They don't understand why we take this little grape juice. They don't understand this ritual here. They don't understand the tithing and offering. Well, a lot of Christians don't understand that because they don't tithe it off and give offerings. So why, why are we expecting non-believers not to understand that? But you see, those are unchurched. How are they going to learn about this table if we don't tell them about this table? Piano. I'm going to stare at this piano every day next week. I'm just going to stare at it. And then the following Sunday, I'm going to play as good as Cindy does. <laughs> If you do not 
already have a solid relationship with them. Them means unbelievers. This is a very important statement. If you do not already have a solid relationship with them, the unbelievers, that would allow you to be able to show them the love of Christ. I'm not talking about hanging out with Christians. I'm talking about deliberately meeting and making friends with unbelievers. You need to get to work at it. Because your relationship with that unbeliever is the one that's going to lead them to Christ. You need to get involved with, non with unbelievers. And many times I hear many voices Many times I hear many people tell me, I'm probably hitting the slides, but they, they tell me, I says, well, I don't, all my friends are Christians. I can't invite people to church because all of my friends are church. So what I'm asking you to do is intentionally go out, out of your comfort zone, out of your little ring of friends, go to the, non, go to the Matthew, the tax collector. Go to those people that do not see things as you do and befriend them. Make friends with them. Build a relationship with them so that you then can have what? Influence on them. I used to tell my sons, my sons go, well, Dad, these people are doing this, this, and this. I said, son, it's okay. As long as you are the ones that are influencing them and that they are not influencing you. Many times with our children, we see them hanging out with kids that are undesirable. And what happens to those kids that are undesirable? They eventually start what? Influencing our children. What we need to train our children is to reverse that. Son, you need to hang out with them, but you need to influence them. How does that happen? It does not happen on Sunday morning at one sermon. It happens in your home. It happens reading the Word of God. We used to read the Bible in our home cover to cover. I used to tell my boys, read, a, read, a, read one chapter, whatever book. Tell me what it says. What does it mean to you what you just read? And I wasn't trying to teach them theological Answers. I wanted them to start thinking about what they're reading and what the Holy Spirit is telling them so that they can understand when someone tells them to read the Word of God. But it takes training. And you have to do it in your home. You have to do it with your grandchildren. If you haven't done if you've not done it with your grown children, then do it with your grandchildren. Great grandchildren. And if you don't have them, adopt some. <laughs> get creative, but get closer. But the problem is, if you're a gunslinger, you know, you probably have the notches on their, on their guns, on their, right? Guys, it's not about how many notches I have on my Bible, okay? Ha ha! I got one of them now. Yes, I got me a notch. I come to church, says, June, you see your Bible. How many notches you got on your Bible? Uh -huh. See, I've got two notches. It's not like that. It's not about notches. It's about loving God. Examples are still necessary. Active or passive. A few examples. I'll just read them to you. Acts, Matthew 5, 14 through 16. But you will receive, I'm sorry, but you will receive power when the Holy Spirit comes to you, and you will be my witness in Jerusalem, in Judea, in Samaria, and the end, and ends of the earth. It says, but when you receive power, Acts 1.8, whenever it happens, conduct yourself in Manny, worthy of God. What does Acts 1.8 tell you? When you receive power, I'm sorry, I got that backwards. Matthew 5, 14. You are the light of the world, a city situated on a hill that cannot be hidden. What does that mean? You need to show, right? So, an example. Acts 1-8 is power. Now, but you are to receive power when the Holy Spirit comes to you, and you will be my witness. At my church. Uh... 
Only places that I'm comfortable talking to. Uh, well, I don't want to go overseas, so I'm not going to do that one. So it means, ends of the earth means, in some places, means the next desk over where you work at. That's not what it says. It says, first in Jerusalem. Why Jerusalem? Why did, why did, Mac, why did uh, the writer of Acts, why did Paul, or Luke, Luke's one name, it was Luke wrote this, wrote, why did he say first in Jerusalem? Where did salvation start? Where did Jesus die? In Jerusalem. So where do, what does that mean to me? It first needs to start right here. It needs to start right here. And then in Judea, right? Which is what? If you're a Jew, what is Judea? Your country. So then it starts here, then it goes to my family, those around me, and then it goes to Samaria. Anybody know what Samaria means? The Jews would walk around Samaria because they were ugly, dirty half-breeds. And I don't want to talk to them. And they would walk around miles to avoid Samaria. Because the Bible says Samarians did not stay pure, they intermarried. And so what is it saying here? First it starts in you, then it goes to people around you, and then it goes to the people you don't like. Yeah, it goes to that person that just doesn't speak like you do. That doesn't look like you do. That doesn't act like you do. It even goes to those people that likes the Cubs. <laughs> or the Pacers. And for all of you guys here that are really good Christians, I want you to go find a friend that's an IU fan. And show them the love of God. That means that means you, you start wearing red. And then to the ends of the earth. Philippians 127. What happens? Whatever happens, conduct yourself in a worthy manner as of the gospel of Jesus Christ. So your conduct. And then uh, Peter talks about speak. Always be prepared to give an answer. Always be prepared to speak. Always be prepared to defend what you believe. Just doing good. Real quick. Christianity is 2.1 billion. Is it a religion? It should not be a religion. It should be a what? A personal relationship. Islam is one point, I'm sorry, we have 1.3 billion, the fastest growing religion today. You know why? It amazes me, they kill a bunch of Americans, and we start telling them, don't talk bad about Islam. We start defending the thing people that are killing us. Non-religious people, secular, agnostics, atheists. According to the Supreme Court though, atheists is considered a religion. A non-belief in something is a belief in something. 1.1 billion. Hinduism, Buddhism, Judaism. All these are religions. But you see, we're not talking about religion here. We're talking about relationships. You don't need, we don't need another relation, a religion. That's why the Methodists, the Presbyterians, the Baptists, the Christians, the Pentecostals, they're not religions. Those are nothing more than a group of believers that like things the way they are doing it. But if you ask a Methodist, who died for you? John Wesley, I doubt he'll answer it that way. If you ask a, 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 a Pentecostal, who died for you? What would he answer? Jesus. Who rose on the third day? Jesus. Who's coming back for his church? Jesus. You can ask any one of those groups, and they're going to give you the same answer. Now, some of them say you should wear a suit, you should wear a collar, you should wear this, you should, well, that's fine. But we shouldn't get wrapped around that. The Bible says, go to all the world. 
and what? Preach, proclaim the gospel to all creatures, all creation. Wherever, whoever believes and is baptized will be saved. But whoever does not believe will be condemned. Is anywhere in here that says we have to convert them? What does that say? It says tell. Go and preach it. Go and tell them. And those that believe will be saved, and those that don't will be condemned. You define what's important to you by what you dedicate your time to. You want to be a great musician? Only practice it one hour every 10 years, and you'll be the greatest musician in the world. So what camp are we in? Be honest with you, I can't answer that. Because that's a choice that you have to make. You have to decide if you are going to be used by Jesus Christ. Are you going to be his hands and feet? Are you going to allow Jesus to put the Holy Spirit in you and move you forward? And are you going to be world changers? And we start with one person. takes one person. The old saying, and I've said this many times, how do you double this church? How can we double this church next Sunday in attendance? If each one of you would bring what? One person. You would double the size of this church in one week. But why can't we bring one person? Because we don't ask. One, we don't ask. And I'm guilty of this one. I have very few, <coughs> matter of fact, here in Peru, Indiana, I have zero friends that are not Christians. Now, I know some people that are not Christians. I've got some neighbors that I maybe should start developing a relationship with them. But honestly, the sermon is about me too. Now, I make excuses, and my excuses is good as yours. Hey, I'm not from here. <laughs> you know? That's just an excuse. Take the time to start searching out for people that you may have a relationship with, with the purpose of leading them to Christ. That is Christ. Oh, Heavenly Father, you are a mighty God. We thank you and praise you. We invite you. Come, Lord Jesus. In the name of Jesus Christ, we pray. Amen. Before we, get, before we go to our songs, you know, July.